Today, the goal for uh, this class is to talk about what is known as time consistency. Of optimal solution or optimal policies. Okay, so we have a dynamic optimization problem. Let me just um, minimum of summation, or let's say j of u0 to ut minus 1, such that xt plus 1 equals to ft xt ut. And I'm sure you have uh, solved several problems in the current assignment where you have to solve problems of this type and you know for sure what kind of solutions you expect to get under certain reasonable assumptions on the cost function and the state transition function. So this minimum is over u naught to ut minus one. And this is known as the Pontryagin maximum principle or Pontryagin minimum principle. The other option is to formulate the problem over closed loop policies. So it's the same cost function, except that now we are looking for policies gamma naught, which maps the state, oh, sorry, gamma t, which maps the state at time t to the action set at time t. And we have exactly the same state transition function. And the minimum is being performed over all the policies gamma t minus one. This was solved using dynamic programming. Okay. So one of the things we were discussing in the previous class was that in the case of Pontryagin maximum principle, what I get is an open loop control. And this open loop control depends on X naught, but it doesn't depend on the intermediate states. So, so each of these UT star is not dependent on XT, uh, the state at that time. And thankfully, some of you were able to talk me out of it, of using this open loop policy while I'm driving a car, right? Because there is a constant feedback needed in order to make sure that I update my state uh, based on the disturbances, external disturbances that I did not model when I was solving the dynamic programming. So there were disturbance in my state transition function, but I had not really modeled it, um, you know, during the course of optimization, but because those disturbance happened, my state has changed. And so therefore the strategy that's supposed to work earlier is not, is no longer feasible. And, and therefore I need to take different action. Okay, so, so PMP gives you open loop control. The dynamic programming will give you the set of strategies that you need to pick. Uh, oh, sorry, the optimal strategy, optimal closed loop strategies or optimal closed loop control policies that you need to pick in order to control the system. Okay. Now, one thing that came out of our discussion uh, on Monday was somebody rightly said that because of disturbance, your state has changed and then you have to recompute the optimal policy. And one thing I had mentioned is that's exactly how things are usually executed in embedded systems where you recompute the open loop control actions um, every 100 milliseconds or every 1000 milliseconds or every 10 seconds or every one hour uh, depending on different applications. So you compute the optimal open loop strat or open loop action uh, using the backpropagation algorithm because your states could have changed uh, depending on the external environment. So you're no longer on the optimal trajectory. So in this case, what you see is under disturbance, we are not at the optimal trajectory. And therefore, 
optimal action needs to be recomputed. Now what happens when you have open, closed loop control is under disturbance, just execute the action according to the optimal policy. Because you can observe the new state, whatever the current state is, and you can just plug that current state into the optimal policy and you get the action that you need to take at that point of time. So you can see that in the case of, well, I'll, I'll, let, I'll pause here and I'll let you think about it. And then we'll continue our discussion uh, after like 10, 15 seconds. Okay, any questions so far on what we have discussed? So all of you agree uh, that if you have disturbance in the system, then you need to recompute if you're looking at open loop policy, but you don't really need to recompute anything if you're looking at closed loop policy. And that's the difference between weakly time consistent optimal solution and strongly time consistent optimal solution. So let me write weakly time consistent optimal policy. So what's the definition? So U zero star to U T minus one star is weekly. Let me just write it in short form. W T C O P weekly time consistent optimal policy. If and only if U T star to U T minus one star is optimal. for the rest of the horizon if xt equals to xt star. No, if uh, U zero star to U T minus one star was applied on the system. Okay, so if you have executed the optimal set of actions until time t, then it is optimal for you to execute the optimal actions in the future. Okay, then it is called weekly time consistent optimal policy. Any question on this definition? Okay. 
let's talk about strongly time consistent was there a question um yeah i had a question but i think this might answer it okay um, optimal policy and let me just write it strongly time consistent optimal policy if and only if gamma t star to gamma t minus 1 star is optimal irrespective of what irrespective of the policies used in the used at time one less than equal to s less than equal to t t minus one Okay, and I want you to look at the two definitions and tell me the policy that comes out of dynamic programming, what kind of policy is that? And the policy that comes out of PMP, what kind of policy is that? Okay, no one has a answer. Right, so the weekly time consistent is, this is the PMP, the policy you get from the Pontryagin maximum principle. That's a weekly time consistent policy because you have to be on the optimal trajectory in order to apply the rest of the optimal solution that you have obtained. And what we had discussed in the previous lecture was when you are driving a car, you have not modeled the environmental uncertainty. Because of those uncertainty, the overall trajectory has changed. And therefore, uh, the policy you had computed at the beginning of time is no longer optimal. So you need to recompute the policy. Maybe I should add here that the states visited were x0 to xt star. X, X1 star two XT star. So in the case of PMP, uh, what you get is a weekly time consistent policy in the case of dynamic programming, what you get is a strongly time consistent optimal policy. So irrespective of whatever you have done in the past, uh, you know, if you're applying, if you're using the dynamic programming based optimal policy, you can just choose to pick the optimal policy for the rest of the time as the one that you computed using dynamic programming. You don't have to recompute uh, the policy uh, at time t all the way up to T minus one, because you have done that once and that's it, that's the optimal policy. Okay, so in practice, of course, what you would like to have is a strongly time consistent optimal policy. So you det determine the policy once, let's say you used a supercomputer to determine what the policy should be. Uh, 
uh, say it's an autonomous car and uh, you have like all sets of all types of sensors uh, which can accurately measure where the other cars are, where the trucks are, where the pedestrian is, where the deers are, where the bison are on the road. And once you have figured that out, you can uh, use the dynamic programming based policy, you can apply that and you get the optimal policy. And then the problem is that, well, so right now, let's not talk about the autonomous car situation because I'll, I'll get into it in a bit. But in that situation, it would be ideal to have a strongly time consistent optimal policy because you don't have to change it um, uh, over a period of time. You can just execute the actions according to this policy. But what happens in reality is of course your sensors are not good. There could be faults in the system. There could be unmodeled dynamics. So let me just write it. So in real systems, there are faults, so something breaks down, there is aging. So, you know, some of the components may change their physical properties over time. Um, so, so this usually happens in electrical systems because the resistance of the wires or resistance or capacitors, uh, the capacitance, all of them change over a period of time because of cyclic loading or because of any other type of aging that happens. So there is false, there is aging, there are unmodeled dynamics. So you designed an airplane and you assume the steady flow behavior for designing the airplane. But when you are actually flying the aircraft in the air, uh, there are turbulence. And because of that turbulence, there are unmodeled dynamics, which you had not modeled when you were originally designing the system. Okay, so that's called unmodeled dynamics because of um, uh, things that you did not anticipate, but is actually true in the real system. There's also unmodeled dynamics in the in the compound pendulum or simple pendulum case. So remember that in the simple pendulum, you assume that this, when you're modeling simple pendulum, which I'm sure many of you have done before, you assume that the string is massless and there is a point mass in the end, right? Uh, that's the assumption in simple pendulum. But if you look at real pendulums, you always, almost always have a mass in this uh, string because it's sometimes made up of metal and it's not really a point mass. It is actually a larger mass. So you can't really replace it with a point. Uh, so those are called unmodeled dynamics. So there is some difference in the actual system, but in order for simplifying, in order to compute the optimal policy, you actually simplified the system um, and, and therefore your dynamics is not the same as what was originally um, uh, derived uh, when you were designing the control policy. So that's called unmodeled dynamics. Then there are of course, environmental noise. So this is something you see in almost all the systems. There is always noise in the system. Um, uh, so in the case of aircraft example, I talked about turbulence. That's the noise part. Um, in the uh, case of uh, driving a vehicle, there are pedestrians, there are animals, there are kids playing on the street. And all of those form the overall, they are the environmental noise. There are other cars on the road and the drivers may be swerving left or right, uh, something that's that you don't control and therefore those are environmental noise that you have to deal with. In the case of wind energy generation, the wind speeds are is almost always uncertain. Uh, that's another source of noise in that particular system. So all of that happens in most of the systems. There are what is called time scale separation So uh, this usually happens in, uh, in a lot of complex systems where you assume, so you send a command to a lower level system and you kind of assume that the command will be, or that trajectory will be followed. But what happens in the lower level system is it has its own dynamics. So it doesn't really accurately track the trajectory. Um, it sort of approximately tracks the trajectory. Uh, and so that leads to, uh, also disturbances on the higher level system. Uh, 
we have a higher level system, it's sending commands to all the lower level systems. But the lower level systems, instead of tracking the trajectory that the higher level system asked it to track, let's say this is what it said, this system to track, it basically tracked almost the same trajectory, but with some small noises. And this, from a higher level systems perspective, this is sort of uh, a noise on the system, but that's that noise is coming because of the lower level system. Uh, so this is kind of stuff that happens in all real systems. So no matter which real system you pick, you will have these situations. And therefore, uh, the weekly time consistent optimal policy needs to be recomputed every time the state transitions or every every few times the state transitions. So maybe every five time steps or every 10 time steps, you will recompute the weekly time consistent optimal policy because you're no longer along the optimal path that you had originally intended to take. Okay, that is not the problem with strongly time consistent optimal policy. So assuming that you have modeled your dynamics pretty well, once you compute the strongly time consistent optimal policy, you don't have to recompute it. Moreover, you will notice that DP is very robust to all the real world issues. So unless the faults are like too bad, the DP can take care of all these other minor things that happens during your uh, operation, okay? So unless the wing of an aircraft got blown up, which almost never happens unless you are in war. So, so the closed loops, uh, the DP based policy would automatically take care of how to fly the aircraft. There will be no problem. But if the faults are really bad, uh, and I'll give you a couple of examples. So if, for instance, there was an incident uh, about 10 years ago when a flock of bird hit a aircraft engine of uh, maybe a United Airlines plane or US Airways plane, some, some, some flight in New York, and it had to uh, land in the Hudson River. So that is the kind of fall that DP cannot take care of. Uh, there was another issue, there was another fault in the Malaysian Airlines where the pitot tube, which measures the airspeed, it got blocked because of some ice crystals and stuff. And due to that, uh, the reading from the pitot tube was very off and therefore the aircraft basically crashed into the ocean. Uh, so, so these are the kind of faults that are extremely disastrous for the system and DP cannot take care of it. But if there are minor faults, then DP can take care of take care of it and you don't have to recompute the optimal solution. Okay. Yes. So with the DP, um, we assume at the big T time, um, that's when we're gonna calculate our, um, that's like our terminal time. Sorry, what did you say? I I'm not able to understand. There's quite a bit of background noise. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Can you just speak louder? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so with DP, we usually have a terminal time. Yes. Yes. So if you have a system that's continuously running, how do you factor that in? Like, say you're driving a car, it's not like at a certain time, then you're gonna uh, hope to have the op be in the optimal state. I see. Yeah, it might be like continuously, like you want to be in the optimal state that's throughout right. the whole drive, right? That's but you right. don't know how long that's the right. drives will last. Yeah, yeah, great question. So what happens when you are at a, at a, if you're operating continuously, so nuclear power plants operate continuously for like 30 years or 40 years, they never shut down. So once they start, they just continue. And, uh, and in those situations, uh, there is something called infinite horizon optimal control, which we are not going to talk about because there are convergence issues in those that you need to worry about. So that's kind of problems are modeled under the infinite horizon optimal control problems. And 
depending on the time scale so if you are driving a car for 20 minutes it's a finite horizon optimal control problem but if you are driving a car for like 8 hours uh even though the horizon is finite you can pretty much model it as an infinite horizon optimal control problem okay so uh so those are the things that you will learn through experience so whether you have a system whether you want to model it as an infinite horizon optimal control or finite horizon optimal control problem and based on that experience you will execute uh, appropriate strategies on the system that's a great question so i have another question yes so the assumption we're making here is that the dp is able to return a solution within for example a requirement of let's say we're running at 10 milliseconds right so we're assuming that um it's able to run and give us an optimal solution that's yes. in 10 milliseconds but that's yes. a constraint because that might not that's be right. possible that's right okay that's right so that's a huge problem by dp is not able to run on many real world systems because of exactly the same reason you mentioned so 10 milliseconds is what would be required uh so in power devices it's usually 100 microseconds or 200 microseconds uh you can't really run a dp in microseconds like there is just no processor in the world that can run a dp in microseconds uh so so in those situations you basically just hand code the rule okay there is some some very simple rule that you kind of know is close to optimal and you just hand code it and that way you don't have to run dp at all uh, of course that's not robust so if your system changes over time then your hand coded policy is no longer optimal and that makes it a big challenge uh so however let me tell you about a recent project that we completed so there there was a requirement that we need to run the dp within 100 milliseconds and we were able to execute dp within 100 milliseconds by adding a bit more computational machinery and by uh, so so we did two things we added the computational machinery and the second thing was we kind of knew what the optimal trajectory was so we constrained the dp we added constraints to the dp so that it wasn't really looking for a solution in like very far off places um so that way we were able to execute the entire dp within 100 milliseconds uh, you know on in a continuous fashion so you will have to apply some tricks which are very much application oriented tricks uh based on the computational power on board in order to make sure that the dp runs every x milliseconds that is required for the operations and if you cannot prove that if you cannot get that you do pontryagin maximum principle if you cannot do that you just hand code you don't care whether it's optimal or not as long as the system works you are happy with it you just hand code it does that make sense yes um so in another scenario you would potentially say um run your dp on a longer time scale right. and have maybe a value function approximation correct and then when you run the dp you update the value function right okay yeah that is called limited look ahead policy you approximate the value function and then you uh just to one step or two step dp while you are on operations and that's also a feasible way to execute dp very quickly on the systems so these these kind of topics are studied under the umbrella of approximate dynamic program and i intend to cover a few topics in the next two weeks uh, okay. of classes yes i have a question yes um how exactly does this kind of relate to other control policies such as like a, a simple pid ah wow that's a very good question okay so how does it relate to simple pid okay so pid is a policy okay so pid controller that you may have studied in your feedback controls class this is just a policy gamma of x uh yeah so it it's actually time invariant it's just gamma of x and if you apply pid controller uh you actually get some cost j of gamma gamma right so you get this cost and this cost may or may not be optimal what you know is if you apply dp what you are guaranteed is j of gamma not star 
to gamma t minus one star is actually less than equal to your cost achieved through the PID controller. Okay, so you may have, uh, I mean, if you read some of the books, uh, advanced books on feedback control systems, there would be PID tuning mechanisms for cost minimization. Okay, so then they are basically trying to get as close to the optimal cost as possible by tuning the weights of the PID controller. Okay. Okay. So dynamic programming is uh, guaranteed to have a loss that's- That's right. Less than what people do. Yeah, have. yeah. So this is the set of all policies, all feedback policies. Uh, this is the set of all closed loop. Uh, this is the cost set of all stable policies. So, you know, you, you do the PID tuning and all that stuff for making sure that your system is stable. Uh, and then this will be your optimal policy. Okay, which you can get from DP. And so when you pick a PID policy, you probably are here. This is your PID policy, but it may be far from your optimal policy. And so you need to tune the PID policy so that you are as close to the optimal policy as possible. Can you speak a little louder? Yeah. Uh, so with the with the PID, because you only have one policy, right? You don't necessarily need to know, uh, like, at what time. Correct. This needs to be completed. Correct. Correct. The optimal policy. Is. Right. 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 So one of the things that you can do is suppose you have to apply PID controller is you can do what is called gain scheduling. So your PID gains change over time. Uh, so you basically read the gains through a microprocessor and then you apply those gains into your system. And uh, that sort of could be close to the optimal policy because you now have a time varying policy and along every time segment, you try to be as close to optimal as possible. Any other question? I'll give you another example of this robustness of DP. Actually, I'm quite, quite a big fan of this robustness property of dynamic programming. So we had, we, I talked to you about the autonomous vehicle project that we were working on. My group was working on with, along with some mechanical engineering uh, faculty and students. And uh, the goal there was to run the DP every 100 milliseconds. And we had a very simplified DP and we were able to execute everything in 100 milliseconds. And we put it in the car and we turned on the air conditioning system only to realize that air conditioning system was an unmodeled dynamics. It was an unmodeled load on the vehicle. And we hadn't accounted for it when we were designing our dynamic programming algorithm. Now, more importantly, the load on the car was dependent on the outside temperature. So if the temperature was very high, the load on the air conditioning system was very high, which translates into a very high load on the car engine. On the other hand, when the temperature outside was pleasant, the air conditioning system didn't have too much load. And therefore, the uh, effect on the engine was pretty minor. And that was the unmodeled dynamics, which we hadn't modeled while we were uh, you know, deriving the DP equations. Uh, but nonetheless, our DP was robust to that unmodeled dynamics part, which is, you know, turning on the air conditioning system or reducing the temperature of the uh, air conditioning system and all that stuff. So that's just, just DP is just plain robust. Like you, you, you don't have to worry at all with DP. For minor unmodeled dynamics, it's just robust. For minor environmental noise, it's just robust. Um, but it's not robust if you have like very sophisticated faults, like your pitot tube not working, 
or your airspeed sensor not working or you know your car breaks down like the powertrain is not working or something like that then that's a pretty major fault and dp cannot take care of it but for most of the other situations dp can take care of the uh, overall system okay so we spent quite a bit of time uh, singing praises about dynamic programming and how complicated dynamic programming is and that you should be happy with a weekly time consistent optimal policy uh, if there are significant time constraints on the computation time. And if you have even more stringent time constraint on the computation time, you basically just hand code the policy. You apply a PID controller or something because there is no way on earth you can uh, do any computation in, in real time. Okay, so that's what we talked about. Now let's consider a situation where there is no time consistency in the optimal policy. So let's talk about human beings. Okay, so I'm going to give you a couple of examples where human beings uh, uh, have time inconsistent optimal policy. So one example that's there in your assignment is as follows. Uh, suppose there is a department seminar and you go to the seminar and there are cookies and coffee and whatnot. And you think about it and you do some calculations in your brain depending on your cost function. So the calculation is as follows. Uh, you want to be healthy. That's your goal. That's your objective function. So J is be healthy and then you have the current reward if you eat the cookie you get some reward and then in order to compensate because you want to be healthy in order to compensate for the fact that you are eating the cookie you want to go to the gym so tomorrow morning so future future reward is go to the gym. Now, this is the optimal policy that you computed in your head when you entered the seminar room and you saw the cookies there. That, okay, I'm going to eat the cookie now and tomorrow morning I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to run like, I don't know, one mile extra in order to burn all the calories that I've received from this cookie. And you eat the cookie and then tomorrow morning you just shut you know you you turn off the alarm and you just sleep away to glory and you wake up and you just go to your first lecture so how many of you have executed this strategy before which is you thought you will do something tomorrow and then you actually didn't do it when the time came to execute that strategy execute that action how many of you have done it so you can you can just maybe write in the chat box and i'll give you the number how many of you have computed the optimal policy and then not stayed on the optimal policy okay so looks like almost everyone not everyone but yeah most of the time okay <laughs> okay so in the chat window i'm seeing that almost everyone has this issue that you compute an optimal strategy for yourself. And when the time comes to actually execute that optimal policy, you just don't execute it, right? It has happened with almost everyone. So in fact, what happens is human beings, what this means is theorem, this is an empirical theorem, so human beings have time inconsistent optimal policy policy computation in the brain all of this computation is happening in the brain okay so uh, it's not your fault it's your brain's fault <laughs> Uh, so human beings have time inconsistent optimal policy computation uh, because you uh, you try to compute the optimal policy, but you don't have the motivation to stay on that optimal track. Okay, and, and economists have been 
heavily puzzled. So you can execute all these time consistent policies on, on, on mechanical systems or on electrical systems. But when it comes to dealing with a human being based system, so whether it's a social network, whether it's contracts, whether it's you know day-to-day -day economic transactions, uh, the problem in those control systems is you have a decision maker who you know is going to be time inconsistent in their behavior. And, and that of course leads to a lot of problems in, in real world or in real world economic transactions. And therefore the government steps in and makes laws and creates processes like contract so that you can't deviate from the behavior that you had initially thought was the optimal behavior for you. Okay, so something like a lease, uh, leasing a house or leasing an apartment or renting an apartment, you get into a 12 month contract with the leasing agency uh, in order to make sure that you stay on the time consistent policy. So you promised at in August of 2020 that uh, you will pay $1,200 a month for rent and you are going to stay on that path until the end of, uh, until the, end of the contract period, which will be August, 2021. Okay, so there are laws in place in order to deal with this, this behavior of time inconsistent policies that, that humans typically execute. Here is another example where I'll show you the time inconsistency. So I give you two options. Option A and option B. I'll give you dollar 10 today and dollar 11 uh, one week later. So maybe maybe two weeks later. Okay, which of the options are you going to pick? Dollar 10 today versus dollar 11 two weeks later. Which of the two options are you going to pick? Again, uh, right in your chat window. I give you two options. Uh, you get $10 today or you get $11 two weeks later. Come on, someone write $11. Almost everyone is $10. Okay, a few people want to get $11, but most of them want $10 today. Okay. So this is the, this option is the most picked option in the class. Now let's me change the option slightly. You have $10 a year later and $11 a year plus two weeks later. Okay, now tell me which option are you going to pick? Again, write in the chat box. Someone wrote $10 a year later, wow. Okay. All right, a lot of people have written that this is this is the option that they will take. Okay, so overwhelmingly response in the class has been that they will pick this option. Uh, if they are given these two options then they will pick this option if they are given these two options. What's the difference between these two options? As far as you know, the dynamic programming goes where you kind of add up the entire cost and you want to optimize it or, or, or you add up the entire reward and you want to maximize the reward. So what's the difference? There is no difference, right? Because, uh, because it's, 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 I mean, if you are profit maximizing, if you are reward maximizing, you would prefer, you should prefer this one, no matter what because $11 is always strictly better than $10. But by the nature, by the way nature has wired human beings, and for that matter, most of the animals, uh, we have a time scale separation in our head. So we have something, so when, it, when things are in a much shorter time scale, we want everything to happen today. But when things are going to happen over a long time scale, we want good things to happen, even if it comes with slight delay to you, 
which is this two weeks of delay. So you want good thing like dollar eleven to come to you uh, two weeks late. I mean one year, two weeks later, because you can wait for two more weeks, given that you have waited for a year. Uh, but when time when things come for immediate reward, uh, you don't want to wait for two weeks just for like one dollar extra. You want to get everything today. Uh, you know, even if it is slightly less amount. And this is another sort of dynamic inconsistency that human beings exhibit um, in our in our day to day behavior. Okay, so this is another instance of time inconsistent optimal policy. So we are just time inconsistent because just by changing, just by moving the time axis, what I'm able to show you is that you switch your optimal policy. Okay, and this is this is true for like a large number of day-to-day -day interactions uh, that people have. So it's not just you who are switch, taking, picking these, these options. Uh, psycho psychologists have done this experiment over several years and they have found this to be the common theme across all types of people. No matter whether they are college graduate, they are not graduate from any of the universities. It doesn't matter whether you are rich or poor. It doesn't matter whether you are um, uh, highly educated or not highly educated, you exhibit these type of these type of behaviors. Um, uh, you know, by the virtue of being a human being. Okay, and now of course uh, it is of interest to economists to model or economists and psychologists to model uh, mathematical equations so that the optimal solution would exhibit this kind of time inconsistency. And one such uh, model is provided in your assignment. I'm sure all of you have done it, which is the hyperbolic discounting. And in the hyperbolic discounting, the idea is that you are going to discount the future in order to compute the optimal action right now. So the policy that you are going to execute at time t is going to be argument of ut of ct xt ut plus some discount factor beta multiplied by s equals to t plus one to t minus one ct cs plus c, c capital T. So you basically discount the future, beta is in zero comma one. So you discount all the rewards you're going to get in the future or all the cost you're going to incur in the future, you're going to discount it. And for the current uh, cost or current reward, you are not going to discount it. So this explains some of the behavior that I talked about earlier. Um, so, so hyperbolic discounting is one such mathematical model, but there are many. Okay, there are many depending on, uh, you know, different situations, how people behave. There are many models, uh, economic models as well as psychological models for that. Uh, the reason why I'm covering this is it may be useful to you in your day-to-day -day activities as you deal with more people or firms or, or your colleagues or your supervisors. Uh, there is always this issue of hyperbolic discounting where people will say something but will not stick to it when that actual time comes in the future. Okay, so now you know the mathematical model because of which that happens. Any question so far? Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause recording and I'm going to discuss about the office hours tomorrow. When would you like to have office hours? So it's 